Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors. This is episode 184 and I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me. As always, I'd like to start by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support my podcast on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Please visit patreon.com slash Talking Tudors for more information. Join the Talking Tudors patron family and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll have access to patron-only monthly giveaways. December's prize is a copy of my new book, The Final Year of Anne Boleyn, and a Tudor-themed Christmas decoration. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. This month, I'll be chatting to historian Matt Lewis about Richard III and the Princes in the Tower. You don't want to miss it. Further details will be published on Patreon. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtutors.threadless.com. I would love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tutors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag ILoveTalkingTutors. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled to share that the brilliant Dr. Owen Emerson recently interviewed me about my new book, The Final Year of Anne Boleyn, and I'm delighted to share our conversation with you today. It's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sayles. Natalie, I cannot tell you how much I enjoyed this incredibly important book and I cannot wait to ask you some questions about it because I've got many. My first one is what inspired you to write it? Hello Owen, it's such a good question. I'm so happy to be here to speak to you about the book. This is actually my first official recording about the book so you know it's wonderful that it's with you, such a wonderful friend. Um, It's a very good question isn't it and I love to ask people that on my podcast when I have people on I always ask them about the inspiration behind their projects because I think it's quite interesting. In this case for me obviously it's been you know I think I was 20 when I first fell in love with the Tudors so it's been a long journey and throughout that time I've always noticed that when things focus on Anne Boleyn's downfall, they tend to obviously focus on those last few crucial months. 
I think that's given a, a little bit of a skewed view of the events of that time. And in the, you know, 20 years or so that I've been reading about this and, and researching this, quite seriously researching it from about 2009, I noticed that 1535 was a very crucial year in many ways. And there was a lot going on in this particular year, which I think we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. I, st- I think to get a better picture, a clearer picture, a more detailed picture of of what happened and why Anne, in fact, was executed. We do need to look very closely at what is happening in 1535. Otherwise, I think there's this sense that, you know, Henry pursued Anne passionately for seven years or so, turned his country upside down. They married, everything was fine, and suddenly he executes her. So I think if we want a fuller picture, we need to look at those previous 12 months or 18 months. And then I think you know, it's still a completely shocking event, but I feel like you become more aware of why it occurred and you do get to know the main players really, really well by delving into this period. So, um, and as you know, oh, there's so many myths and misconceptions about this time, really about Anne's entire life, but in particular around the downfall, there's a lot of things that we see on, you know, in fictional works, in films, even in, in other biographies that are just simply not grounded in fact. So, I suppose I wanted to really look at everything for myself, see what evidence we do have, and then make my own sort of assessment of the period. And I wanted to put this into a really engaging narrative that people could access easily, people that are interested in Anne's life. So yeah, that was kind of the inspiration. That's so interesting. And I think you're completely right. I think because of popular culture, we're encouraged to see, you know, this this long uh, romance, this long affair, and then a, a really short and brief reign of Anne, and also a very brief period of happiness, of, of married happiness and everything's downhill from there so you you've chosen to focus on let's say 18 months of Anne's life can you set the scene for us what is happening in England in late 1534 early 1535 you're going to have to bear with me with this one oh there is a lot going on and I actually think I need to go back just a tiny bit into 1534 for this one, because there are some important acts that we need to to sort of cover just briefly so that everyone is up to date with what is going on. So of course, we know Anne becomes queen in 1533. She gives birth to Elizabeth in September of that year. The following year, there is a new succession act, which is introduced. So this formally recognizes Anne as queen, and it in fact forbids Henry's subjects and Anne's subjects from appealing to Rome for any reason. So we know this becomes relevant very soon. The king and Anne's children are pronounced as the lawful heirs to the Tudor throne, and Catherine of Aragon is can only be referred to as the Dowager Princess. She's no longer the Queen of England. So we have the Succession Act, but we then the we also have a new Act of Supremacy. So this recognizes Henry as supreme head of the church. Now, in order to ensure the stability of the new Act of Succession. There is a new this new treason act that's brought in, and it is not popular. This is the first time that spoken or written words constitute high treason. So you can just imagine how this can be used and abused, and it and it is. And I do go into quite a lot of detail about the people that are using this to their benefit. So it's not happy. And there's also what's called an act respecting the oath to succession. So there's an oath that people need to take. This, of course, lands people like Thomas More into very hot water because he won't uh, make the oath. So there's a lot of that going on. There's also, of course, a lot of uh, religious contentious debates. You know, there are some things that you simply cannot discuss at this time. It is too dangerous to be talking about purgatory, for example, honoring the saints, you know, marriage of priests, justification by faith, pilgrimages, miracles. They're all the things that Anne would have been thinking about, discussing, but they're they're things that the subjects of Anne and Henry are encouraged not to to speak about. This gets um, somewhat resolved following Anne's execution with the the 10 articles that are brought in. But to be honest, it's still very kind of grey water and people don't know what they're supposed to be doing, how they're supposed to be worshipping. So it's it's a time where people are very confused. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of suspicion. Um, It's a very sort of stressful time. Unfortunately, added to that, there are lots of other strains on the the marriage. So there's the very real possibility that there's going to be an invasion by the combined Catholic powers of Francis I, Charles V. Now, you and I know that this never happened, that they never did this, but we have to put ourselves into their shoes. This was a very real threat. People were very concerned about this. So was Henry. He was extremely worried about this. There's rebellion in Ireland that broke out in late 1534 and is still kind of rearing its its head in 1535. 
there is a real concern that the Lady Mary, so Catherine of Aragon's daughter, is going to be, I was going to say kidnapped, but not kidnapped, that she's going to be kind of taken away and, and hidden overseas in Europe. Henry is very concerned about this. And to be honest, Owen, it's a real threat. There is discussion about this with Chapuis and his his contacts. There's, so there's this atmosphere where everyone is distrusting each other. There's everyone suspicious. It's fueled by this new treason act because now your words can land you on the executioner's block. So it's it's you know a really scary time. And on top of this, we have excessive rainfall really excessive, I know it's England, but excessive rainfall that leads to the crops failing. So there is famine and there is increased food prices and inflation. So not only are the people concerned about their, you know, their trade routes, are they going to continue? They're also concerned about whether they're going to eat another meal. And you know that with this kind of weather where it's kind of wet and, and hot, when summer comes, there is plague. So this, there's all these kind of pressures and everything that is happening in 1535. And Anne is, is trying to navigate her way through this. Henry does get the blame a lot from people, but Anne is generally the scapegoat. So people are upset. It's difficult to blame your own king, anointed king, but to blame Anne is, is an easy sort of thing to do. So she does end up bearing the brunt of a lot of the, the disgruntled subjects in the country. That is so fascinating. You, you put that so beautifully. I mean, England really is like a pressure cooker at this moment, isn't it? You know, we've got religious divide. We've got pressures from Parliament. We've got these thought crimes <laughs> happening, yeah. um, which is really quite terrifying in, in anyone's imagination. We've got threat from abroad. This must all be having something of an effect on that marriage what are the pressures on Henry and Anne at this point yes well obviously you know there's the unpopularity kind of aspect of it that we know and we've spoken about this before Owen that when you know Henry has a fantasy playing in his head it is it's like a recording imagine it like a recording and and it's what he wants his ideal life to kind of be like and when that fantasy does not match the reality people die that is the bottom line. You know, we see this over and over repeated throughout his reign. So in his mind, you know, Anne was his mistress. She ticked all the boxes when she was his mistress. Absolutely every single one of them. Then she transitions into becoming his queen. Their relationship is still based on emotion. It's still based on emotion, which is, is very rare because if you think about royal marriages at this time, they're, of course, normally an arrangement, you know, based on, on politics and making important connections. But Anne is a subject of Henry's and becomes his wife. So it's always this kind of um, tempestuous kind of relationship between the two of them. So they have Henry is he's worried. He's worried about all these things that are going on in his country. He sees that his queen is unpopular. And even though there is this treason act, it doesn't stop people from making really, really outlandish kind of claims and blaming Anne for the weather. You know, she's apparently responsible for the crops failing, for the all the rain. She's she's blamed for absolutely everything. And of course, people feel that because of her religious views, and maybe we'll talk about in a little bit, that she is in some way poisoning Henry's ear. Her and Cromwell, Thomas Cromwell, are normally blamed, blamed for that. So they have all these pressures. Now, of course, the one we haven't mentioned is that they have a daughter, the beautiful Elizabeth, very clever, precocious girl. In 1534, unfortunately, I know it's often referred to as a miscarriage, but I quite strongly believe it was a stillbirth very late into the pregnancy. So they've just had this tragedy in 1534. They've, they've got a beautiful daughter, but of course, Henry wants a son, as we all know. He wants a son, and that has not happened for the couple just yet. And because of these pressures, these pressures affect Anne's personality quite intensely. She is magnificent and brilliant, but stress enhances her irritability. You know, strain brings out her reckless side and she does not feel secure in her position. She has never felt secure in her position. If we think of someone like Catherine of Aragon, for example, she was able to, to be this sort of untarnished, perfect queen because she, she was secure in her position from the beginning. Her position was not contested. She had support, very incredible support from overseas. She was born, basically, that's all she remembers, to be England's queen. Anne is a very different story. So she is insecure. She came into this as, let's say, you know, the other woman in quotes. So she knows that this could happen again. Henry's eye could wonder and it could happen again. So Anne being insecure leads to her behaving 
perhaps in ways that were sometimes counterproductive for her, to put it mildly. I think Eric Ives put it brilliantly when he when he said that because their relationship was based on this, this emotion and this sort of passion that they had for each other, which was quite obvious, she had to behave like a queen but continue challenging like a mistress. And this is very important because she's walking that almost impossible tightrope of having to be the untarnished, unblemished, you know, queen of England, but also exciting and, and sexy so that Henry's eye doesn't wander too far from their bedroom. So it's it's an incredibly difficult position that she is in. And these pressures that we've talked about are just making them both irritable and they're not spending as much time together as they probably did in the past. And this is commented on by, you know, people like Chapuy who comments, oh, he he never used to be able to leave her for an hour. And now, you know, they're spending time apart. So yeah, so much happening on. That is so fascinating. And I really think it's very important. Uh, and it's it's something you make in, you know, really clear in, in the book is that marriages of this period are meant to bring stability, aren't they? They really are. That, you know, like the, the marriage uh, between Henry and Catherine, again, was founded upon this promise of stability, of, of union uh, between countries, between, uh, a, you know, forging an alliance. And actually, the marriage with Anne has brought everything but stability, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah. It's, um, and really, the thing binding them together is exactly as you put it. It's love. It's emotion, isn't it? That's really difficult to maintain when there is so much at stake. What, what would you actually you know, characterise Anne's state of mind as being in 1535? Yeah, you know, this is one of those things where I was kind of shocked when I started really diving in because I don't see, I don't think we, we see this very often. I don't, don't think we speak about this very often. But I would actually go as far as saying that at the beginning of 1535, she was having a mental breakdown. She was just not behaving as she usually behaved. She actually went as far as to to say to a, a French ambassador that was at court that she knows that all eyes are on her. And she she feels that pressure and that weight of having to try to, to do her job. And we might speak about this as well, that we often forget that she had responsibilities as the Queen of England. You know, it wasn't just all sitting in her chambers embroidering. Like Anne was very active in the management of her household. So she's got those pressures where she's trying to do the best she can do. She wasn't raised to be a queen. She is learning on the job. We could, you know, I think we can say that as well. And but then she knows she knows her husband's personality. She understands Henry. She's seen what he's like. She understands she's very intelligent. So she she sees that she, you know, the threats that are very nearby. She knows she's not hugely popular with people at court. Um, she has her family and they're very close knit. And I think, you know, we can talk about her and George in, in a little bit, but they are two peas in a pod. They're, they're just, they're just so brilliant, but unfortunately that great some people at court and, and they're not always very popular. So I actually feel that she was on the verge of a nervous breakdown in 1535. We, we see an improvement and we'll talk about the progress, I hope soon, but we do see an improvement, but then we see a decline again, of course, in 1536. So it's very up and down. Her moods are changing constantly. I don't know that she would have been the most pleasant person to be around Owen at this point because she is extremely stressed and she has a very sharp tongue as well when she's under pressure. You know, I, I actually think your reading of this period is unparalleled because I've always felt from the sources that this is the point in which Anne actually might have cracked. You know, that I don't think we can sort of overstate how much pressure she was under at this point. And let's not forget, in those, in those seven years of the courtship, Anne had periods away from court, not least at Hever Castle. Uh, she was quite often leaving that pressure cooker and being out of sight, if not out of mind, uh, for the rest of the court. So she's transferring into a completely different realm, isn't she? She is never off show now. And she's not the person they're talking about, you know, behind her back. This is, you know, she's front and centre of the court. So I, I think this is one of the most compelling parts of your book is this really forensic understanding of how volatile she is at this point. It's quite remarkable. So you mentioned there very briefly about the progress that happens in 1535. Can you tell us, are there any insights that you can share with the listeners 
about Henry and Anne's relationship in relation to that progress? What what happens? What goes on? Absolutely. And I, I do also just want to comment just before I, I discuss this, that you're so right. Like, it's so easy for us to forget that pressure of having people watching you all the time. And I suppose perhaps today's kind of celebrities might know a little bit about what that feels like. But even then, they have their homes, which are hopefully private places for them. Whereas Anne, there is no place to hide. Even when she goes to the toilet, she's got someone there with her. You know, she sleeps with a woman one of her ladies sleeping by her bed. There is no moment where she can kind of just, perhaps when she's in prayer, maybe, you know, I don't know if there were some quiet moments there for her, but but I mean, most of the time, people are watching her. They're not just watching her though, they're judging her constantly, everything she does, comparing her continuously to Catherine of Aragon. You know, how is she stacking up? Is she doing the right thing? Oh, she doesn't know how to do that. Like it must, it must have just been so awful and so exhausting, I think, as well. So this is where the, the progress is a really interesting period. So we're talking about the 1535 progress. It is the second longest progress in Henry VIII's reign, incredibly politically important. So there's all that wonderful stuff, you know, to do with obviously religion and visiting people that supported the couple. They're basically on the road for three and a half you know, almost four months traveling around through the West Country. They're visiting people that supported their marriage, but they're also checking up on people, which is what I love about progresses. You know, you get to travel around the country and pop in and visit people and see what they're doing. And of course, you know, take um, advantage of, of hospitality and try not to pay for things as you're on the road. Um, <laughs> so the progresses in themselves are fascinating. And I've been studying these for a long time and have written books, you know, about these progresses because I do love them. They're just, they're quite amazing. But interestingly, Henry and Anne depart a little bit later than than scheduled, actually. So the way progress works, they will generally put a, a sort of schedule out, which we call, it's got a very strange name. It's either a geist or a geist. I never know how to pronounce it. But it's basically just a schedule of where they're going to be, how many miles they're going to travel per day and where they're stopping so that everyone who's following can know, you know, budget for themselves and work out how they're going to join the progress or where they're going to join. So they left a little later than scheduled. They actually ended up leaving just after Thomas. I think it was actually the day of Thomas More's execution, to be honest with you. They leave Windsor Castle. You know, there's this sense, there is this sense that they're escaping. There's a very real sense that they are, they've made this kind of pact. They need to get away. They realize their relationship is crumbling and they need to, to get away for a little while, leave London. There's all those threats we talked about, the plague, etc., and all those eyes on them. There's also now, as news trickles out throughout Europe, that, that Thomas More and, and John Fisher have been executed. There is just, you, you can just imagine the backlash from, from that directed at, at Henry but Anna as well. So they travel around the country, they're visiting people. And what the, the sense I really got is, is a sense of renewed intimacy. So if we think about those things that attracted them to each other in the first place, and the things that really connected them, you know, their love, their absolute love of hunting, both of them, brilliant horse people, you know, they are amazing and can actually match men in the saddle. She can be in the saddle from morning till night. She is and that gives you a sense of how fit she was. She would have been incredibly fit. So they're, they're hunting, they're hawking. It's the time for all those pastimes that they love. They are playing cards, they're gambling. They're both big gamblers. Henry generally loses a lot and, and wins money from him quite frequently. Uh, they are gambling with people they like. They're surrounding themselves with people that that they enjoy spending time with. They are, of course, music, huge part of, of the Tudor court, and it travels with them on progress. So they are listening to music. They're obviously having people perform for them, including one Mark Smeaton, of course, that performs at Winchester. So they are doing all those things that they love, and, and you sort of see them blossom. You see that relationship come to life again. It's like this new life has been breathed into this particular relationship. They're moving around, so they're being active. They, you know, they're traveling around 15 miles a day was the sort of common, common period. They're staying briefly if it's a smaller house, like with a courtier, long periods if they're at a royal castle, for example, you know, more than 10 days at Thornbury Castle because it's it's a royal palace. It fits most of the court. It's wonderful. They stay at Sudley. Very common for the court to be split, though. So we don't, they don't all tend to stay at the same place. So when, the, when Anne and Henry are at Sudley, a lot of the court is at Winchcombe, Winchcombe Abbey. We have Thomas Cromwell that joins them there as well, which is interesting, because at the same time, while they're kind of enjoying themselves, and there are lots of reports of, oh, goodness, the king has not signed one single document since he's been on progress. So 
you get this sense of Henry saying, you know what, I'm just going to have a break, you know, from, from that pressure and enjoy myself with Anne. And lots and lots of correspondence saying that the king and queen are merry. So they're happy, you know, they're enjoying themselves. There's commentary about the court, the other courtiers that are accompanying them, having a good time. You just get, it's like a weight is lifted during that period, during those few months. But, you know, it's not like the politics of the day doesn't, doesn't just stop. We have Chapuis that's in London keeping a very close eye on the court and and commenting on what is happening. We also have Thomas Cromwell that joins them at at Winchcombe Abbey, Sutley Castle, and he is beginning, he's sending his commissioners a fanning out from wherever he is to investigate the the monastery. So they're going and asking all sorts of questions, collecting relics. I think when you look closely at this period, you do get a sense that they have reconnected, renewed sense of intimacy. And of course, this is not just my imagination, this is confirmed because Anne falls pregnant towards the end of this particular progress. So, it, it, and I always find it interesting because, so this is the progress where Anne sends some of her men to Hales Abbey to investigate a very famous relic, which is said to be a phial of the blood of Christ. And and so I think it's really great because that religious side of Anne is often missing in accounts of her. You know, we, we get the sexy Anne a lot, don't we? We get the witty, the sexy Anne, but do we get the pious Anne enough? And I know we've spoken about this. I'm not sure. So I I really like to focus on that particular episode because we do see Anne, the religious reformer, you know, she has, she does not like relics. False relics are one of her sort of the things she despises the most. And Thomas Cromwell is being, and I I sort of picture her having a look at the ones that are being brought in because he is receiving bags full of relics every day, pretty much on this progress that are being collected as his men fan out and investigate the places. So, so it's it's an incredible period, and it and it sees a renewed intimacy with the couple, which I think is is quite wonderful. It really is, and I think you capture that sunshine coming through the clouds, you know. Anne and Henry's relationship is sunshine and storms, isn't it? And this very much is a sunshine period. But you also get the sense, just like the weather, that even this is out of their control. Even the happy times mm-hmm. are finite, you know. And I I, I think you, you capture this period really brilliantly. It does feel like sort of a second honeymoon for them. It's It's kind of sad in a way that they can't yeah. stay at this point I have to say, I was walk... sad writing it I, I, I obviously yeah. I know what comes what's coming and you know what's interesting Owen that it's almost like I sort of felt like I knew what was coming and I sort of feel like they felt like they knew what was coming because they were supposed to you know the the return leg home was supposed to take something like a week 10 days it literally took over a month they yeah. they just extended it and extended it to the point where in the end people said you've got to get back to to London you know you can't be on progress the whole year so you get that feeling that they were hanging on to something that they knew was very fragile and I think even Henry is an interesting character but I think he even knew that change was coming you know that's so interesting. I, I'm I'm immediately reminded of that other period where they take ages to get back to London, and that's when they land uh, from Calais after yes. they visited Francis, and when they most likely have their first secret marriage on on Saint Erkenbald's Day, and they are again absent for many many days and take a hell of a long time to get back. <laughs> And it, it, you're completely right. When things, when the stakes are really high, when those emotions are most uh, intense, they very much are almost inseparable. They don't want to return to the reality of the the implications of their relationship. Um, yeah. You know, when they're alone together, it seems to work. It's when they have to put it into practice that things start to go badly wrong for them I think it's when they are at the mercy of other people now talking of other people Anne's relationship we need to get to grips with what her relationship was like with some of the key players uh, at stake here at the moment and I'm thinking firstly of the Lady Mary Princess Mary and um, yes. <laughs> current currently titled the the Lady Mary What's this is like? such a, yeah it's, it's a difficult one and and look I tried my very best to go into this with a, a sort of open mind and not with my you know not not with the Berlin supporter mind on but just with just observing and seeing what what does the evidence actually tell us 
And I can tell you that what the evidence actually tells us is that Anne reached out on at least three occasions, extended an olive branch to the Lady Mary, only to be very publicly rejected and humiliated. Now, I can see this story from both sides, of course, from Lady Mary's perspective, you know, her life has been turned upside down because of Henry's obsession with Anne. And now Anne is queen. And she's, of course, expected to, you know, to respect that. But she is having none of it. She is absolutely rejecting any kind of thing that Anne does. And Anne herself, because I mentioned she's going through these irritable periods, does behave in ways that are counterproductive as well. But I should say that she actually reaches out on two occasions in early 1534. Um, there's one, for example, at Elton Palace when they when they go to visit Elizabeth, because of course Mary has now been made to kind of serve Elizabeth, which is extremely awkward situation. Very, very awkward. You know, Elizabeth's an infant and the Lady Mary is a late teenager. So it's a very difficult situation, particularly for the people that are in charge of that household. I think if I had been told I had to be in charge of that household, I would have run a million miles because it's an awful job. You know, she's not allowed to really see Chapuis' men when they visit. Henry needs to approve everything. It's a very restrictive life for the Lady Mary at this point. So we do see Anne reach out twice in 1534. She also reaches out again quite towards the end after Catherine of Aragon's death in January 1536, basically saying, look, come to court. I'll be like a mother to you. You know, you won't have to carry my train. You can basically walk beside me. She was trying everything, but Mary was not having any of it. The only queen she recognized was her mother. That's the only marriage. I suppose there have been a lot of judgments made against Anne for her behavior. But I need to, again, draw people's attention back to the fact of the pressure that Anne was under. And this is not just your teenage stepdaughter not liking you. This is a prospective heir to the Tudor throne that wants to take your daughter's position. Um, so I think we need to be very clear about what is happening here. You know, Mary understood her rights very, very well and did not want Elizabeth to be ahead of her in, in that succession list. So it, it it's quite awful. It gets quite nasty to the point where, you know, if Elizabeth was being put on a barge, Mary would make sure she's up earlier to get on the barge first so she could get the, the best spot. So it got very, and, you know, mind you, Elizabeth's only a little infant, so it was all a bit messy and yucky. Chapuy kind of advises her to stop being so obstinate and to listen to her father more because he knows what Henry's capable of. That's the thing. And he's genuinely fearing for Mary's life. So there are these these moments where Anne attempts to reach out, but there are also moments where she's completely and utterly frustrated with Mary. The other thing I try to emphasize in the book was that I don't think we can blame Anne because Henry himself was just beside himself. He could actually not even begin to comprehend that, that Catherine of Aragon, that Mary, were not doing as he said. He found this unnatural and just infuriating. So they were, he didn't need any goading on this behalf. He was quite happy to to meet out this treatment to his daughter. He, I don't think he needed Anne. I don't think Anne needed to say anything, to be honest. I think it was Henry who was controlling this situation. So any kind of, you know, Chapuis, of course, like to blame Anne in his letters. But I think we have to just admit that Henry was infuriated, that he wasn't being listened to, especially a woman, his daughter. Like this was just, he couldn't believe it. So the treatment, Mary's treatment, is Henry's responsibility. Like he's her father, he's the king. Um, like I say, yes, Anne makes some remarks that are perhaps not very queen-like, but she has that huge pressure and she's she's doing her best to navigate that very, very difficult relationship. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because there are there are times where Anne acts towards Mary in a way that is, you know, unjustifiable. But at the center of all of this is Anne being the scapegoat in a way because it's far easier to get at Anne and to blame Anne than it is to blame Henry particularly for Mary Anne's an, an easy person to insult Chapuis is an easy person to blame for Mary's treatment and Anne can't get a breath here can she <laughs> because no, <that's> awful. <laughs> like you like you say Henry, Henry needs absolutely no encouragement whatsoever to treat Mary in the way he does I mean, we know for a fact that the next queen, Jane, is outwardly sympathetic. And yet Mary's treatment is arguably worse. Yeah. So th this really is Henry's doing. This is his daughter. And I really like that you've given them both a really fair hearing in this book. I think that's so, so important. 
Yeah, it's it's a difficult one. It is it is a difficult one because of course you can see both sides to the story. It's you know we can put yeah. ourselves in their shoes and you can understand Mary's point of view, of course, but you can also understand Anne's point of view. She's protecting Elizabeth. She's got this tiny little infant that she is protecting, and any mother or parent out there listening will understand. You will do anything for your child. So you know, and you can see how Catherine of Aragon, which we haven't spoken much about yet, at this point is is basically at Kim Bolton Castle, encouraging Mary's obstinacy. At one point of says course, they're yeah. quite happy to become martyrs. This is Catherine's yeah. mentality. She's not giving this up for anything. There is nobody or nothing that's going to make her give up what she thinks is rightfully hers and Mary's. So it's this real battle of the wills. And I think at one point Anne makes a comment that that Mary is her death and she's hers. That's how she's feeling. She's feeling there's no way out except one of them literally dying which is so awful to think of her having to have that pressure added to everything else we've talked about. It really is. It, it, it's quite a difficult situation to negotiate, like as a historian, isn't it? Because you've got to be fair to both, all three of these women, really. You've got to be fair to Mary. You've got to be fair to Catherine. Actually, there are, there are moments with Catherine. I mean, I have so much admiration for her. And yet there are there are moments where you're like, are you, you know, I do not want to blame her in the slightest. She has literally done nothing to be in this position. But you are thinking, like, if I was in that position, would I, would I be giving that counsel to my child? Would I want to be putting her in that position? Would I want to be encouraging that risk to her life? And, you know, God, we're, it's so, it's so easy to say that from you know, the comfort of my gender and the comfort of my home uh, and the comfort of my 21st century perspective. But, you know, you you do really have to, you know, sort of take a step back and really try and put yourself in these people's shoes. And the nexus of all of their ills is Henry at this point. It, it really very it much really is. It really is. It really is. And I think sometimes we forget that. And, you know, we've talked about this in fictional portrayals where he, he gets let off the hook. Yeah. And I just can't believe it because he is he is the one managing absolutely everything at this point. And it becomes, of course, more obvious towards late 1535 and 1536. But he is, and I think I called him in the book, the, the ultimate puppeteer, because that is what I feel. Henry is there pulling the strings. He knows he has everyone in the palm of his hands, despite what some people might think at certain points that they're in control. And we see people think that and we see them end really terribly when they feel like, oh, perhaps, you know, it's me making the decisions, not Henry. And we see it with Cromwell, we see it with Anne, you know, we see it with Wolsey. And what happens to them? They all end up exactly the same way because it is Henry. It's always Henry in control. That's such a such a brilliant point. You know, there have always been, you know, these these divides, really, I would say, between, you know, what was Henry a passive king? Was he actually being manipulated and led? And actually, even when I think you can see people believing they are manipulating him he's willingly <laughs> allowing them uh, that role and he's you're, a you're so right oh, and he's constantly yeah. performing he he's brilliant at it he knows what he does well and so even as you say when it might appear oh perhaps someone has you know maneuvered him or or something it is henry allowing himself to be because he wants to be seen in a certain light so we do see it you know occasionally where, where it looks like someone's manipulated him or, or pushed him into a certain position. But it's always because he has something in the back of his head that he's planning for. So, you know, he wants to be seen in a certain way or it benefits him in some way. Basically, that's what I'm trying to say. He never does anything to benefit someone else. It's always to benefit him, whether it's about how yeah. he looks, how he presents himself. And and I think I know that, that people find it hard to, to kind of believe that because we have such strong characters around him. But I really do think he was always in charge. So, so true. My next question is, again, talking about Anne's relationship. And it's a, it's a dual one, really, because these are two individuals who historically have been charged, shall we say, with being solely responsible for the downfall of Anne Boleyn. One is Thomas Cromwell, Henry's chief advisor at this point. The other is Anne's sister-in-law, Jane Boleyn. Please tell me what you think Anne's relationship is like with Cromwell and Jane. I might, I might start with with Thomas Cromwell because this is this is such an interesting one, I think. And it's it, it's again, I had lots of those kind of aha moments where I'm like, oh, Gosh, I really had this completely wrong. And I think the traditional narrative 
tells us that Thomas Cromwell and Anne Boleyn were allies. You know, they they both were passionate reformers. They were allies. And then they had a falling out sort of towards the end of 1535 or 1536 about how to distribute the monies from the dissolution of the monasteries. This is what we hear so, so often and we see it on films and we read it in books and we read it in biographies as well as fictional accounts. And it's just not grounded in any sort of fact, unfortunately. And look, I am, as you know, a Berlin admirer. I would love for Anne and Cromwell to have had that relationship. But there is absolutely zero evidence for anything other than a working relationship, you know, kind of just a sort of professional relationship. Basically, what I found is that they put up with each other while Henry wanted them both. And that the minute that that changed, their relationship changed. So Cromwell, of course, doesn't owe his rise to Anne, say, like someone like Thomas Cranmer, that owes his rise to the Boleyns because they did, in fact, help him get to where he was. And they had a much more positive relationship, I think. But Thomas Cromwell was Wolsey's man first, Thomas Wolsey. And we know that we can debate how much sort of Anne had to do with Wolsey's downfall. Some people think a lot. Some people think not that much. She had something to do. I think we can all admit that. Cromwell never forgot that. Never, absolutely never forgot that. And even to the point where he incorporated, you know, Wolsey's insignia into his and his own arms, into his arms. So as a tribute to this man that he was dedicated to. So once Wolsey is gone, Cromwell finds his way into Henry's service and then he becomes Henry's man. I actually can't emphasize this enough. Thomas Cromwell was not Anne Boleyn's man. And I know the wonderful Professor Eric Ives makes that statement in his biography. And I can see where he was coming from when he wrote that. However, I think the evidence points to the fact that Cromwell was absolutely working for Henry 24 hours a day, working his butt off for Henry and not for Anne Boleyn. While those two things coincided, while Henry wanted Anne Boleyn, fine. Cromwell knew what he had to do. The moment he got whiff of the fact that Henry was beginning to shift in his emotions, in his feelings, that relationship starts to break down really publicly as well. So there are moments in 1535, so we're not even talking 1536, early 1535 where Cromwell and he, Cromwell always has these amazing conversations with Eustace Chapuis, the imperial ambassador, that are just fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And he's always, it's interesting because he's always very candid with him. So we get these interesting insights. Yeah, and this continues on until, until... you know, Chapuis leaves the country. So there's one instance where he he sort of says, oh, if Anne, you know, if she knew how close we were, she'd have my head. And he says that, and he's talking in 1535. So we've still got a long time to go until the end, but already he's well aware of what their relationship is. And and, and, and it's interesting because Chapuis can't quite believe it. He sort of feels like, is he lying to me? What what is happening? Because he, he feels that their religious views connect them and kind of bring them together. But th- those religious views are also quite different as well, you know. But Chapuis only, yeah. he just puts everyone in the same sort of, you know, basket. Or they're just kind of reformers, we'll just put them in into the same basket. But So they have a very, oh, it's such a difficult relationship and it gets worse and the cracks start to, you know, really appear. And I think the, the complete breakdown happens probably the event that people know really well, the Passion Sunday sermon where Anne's, uh, where John Skip makes a very scathing attack and a very clear attack on Cromwell's policies towards the monasteries. And it is backed by Anne 150%. She's, she's, she knows what's going on. This is April 1536. So this is sort of her way of defending herself, of attacking Cromwell. And it's all on after that. Oh, and after that, yes, it is. It's kind of scary to watch how things unfurl after that particular sermon, where basically he's compared to the biblical traitor Haman. I think you pronounce Haman or Haman. And so it's basically Anne saying that she wants him dead. It's a death threat, isn't it? It really is a complete death death threat. And it's amazing. Like I, I know it's awful, but I sort of think, wow, how courageous was she? She knew and knew that, you know, things were going on. She knew things were not well with her relationship with Henry. She understood that she needed Henry's protection because she is not a foreign princess. She does not have the Emperor Charles V waiting to defend her and, you know, invade on her behalf. She is pretty much alone and she knows she has to protect Elizabeth and her family. And she just, I, it's its actually an incredible event. And we see such a brave and courageous Anne at that point, you know, trying to make Henry see what is happening. Although, as we all know, Henry knew exactly what was happening. Absolutely. I think you're so, so right. I've, I 
you know, I, I think it's really very difficult actually to construct an argument that Cromwell and Anne liked each other, let alone were allies, were supporters, were, you know, united in a, a vision for religious reform. I just don't see that evidence anywhere, to be honest. But, you know, it's, I suppose what Ives, Ives was looking really at, at Cromwell being the, the great betrayer with this idea that, you know, Cromwell had masterminded the, the, yes. the whole affair. I was just going to say that a few other things that I should probably add, and then maybe we can touch on. Yes, Ives did not want to blame Henry. He wanted to he wanted to blame Cromwell in the end, which is interesting because he wanted him to be her ally, but then he also wanted to kind of lay the blame on on him as well, which is quite interesting. But from that moment where I think Cromwell realizes that Anne wants his head, she actually, you know, she wants him. She wants him dead. And we see a shift in what happens and things speed up really quickly. So I understand why people might think, well, it's all Cromwell's doing because he felt vulnerable. And there is, there is an element of that, you know, definitely going on. But I think that basically it was Cromwell's job to know what Henry wanted. You know, his remembrances are full of, you know, to know the King's pleasure about this or that birds, you know, what he wants to eat, all sorts of things. And Cromwell was a genius. He was brilliant at that. So I think he he very much understood that what Henry wanted was Anne removed permanently. He didn't want her exiled. He didn't want her, you know, I don't know, sent to a nunnery somewhere. He wanted her gone. And there are reasons for that. And we'll come up to that. And Cromwell understood that. So Cromwell was Henry's man. He was just simply finding a way out for the king. And the way out that he offered would have consequences that I don't even think Cromwell realised to be honest with you, you know, the power he gave Henry in that moment when he, I don't know, of course, I can't know exactly how this came about, whether it was a conversation, what it was, but when, you know, a more permanent uh, removal of Anne was suggested, opened a can of worms that were never, it was never shut again, basically. You know, the king knew no end to his power after that, basically. Um, And I think importantly, when it comes to Anne and Cromwell's relationship, we have to remember that Cromwell, basically every evidence that can be put forth for them being allies can be refuted quite easily. For example, yes, he organised Anne's coronation because Henry told him to. <laughs> he was, but importantly, he wasn't raised to the period until after her execution. He took over Anne's father's role, which was a very important role at court after Anne's execution. And we see him gradually rise in power after Anne's execution. She was basically putting a hold on all that. It is clear and obvious that while she was around, that wasn't going to happen. So Anne's removal obviously benefited Cromwell. There's no, there's no doubt about it. But was he solely responsible for her removal? No, I don't think so. Do you think, before we go on to talk about um, the last person in that trio, Jane, do you think that this need to see Cromwell as an ally, this need to see him as the great betrayer, comes about because people want to believe in the Henry and Anne, the lovers, the sort of dream almost, that there is this third party, this malevolent third party yeah. that breaks them apart. And, you know, is that possibly why Jane Boleyn is also apportioned that role in this story? Absolutely. I think you, you've you just absolutely hit the nail on the head. So I think that there's this this real need, and it might be even a subconscious thing. Like we really want Henry and Anne's story to be a love story. And if there's no malevolent third party, then it's Henry's fault. And how do we, you know, how do we get that in our heads? How do we get around it being a love story, but then Henry turning on her so violently and, and killing her? So that's why many historians, and there's still many today that say Henry believed the charges against Anne because that's one way that we can justify what he's done. You know, if he believes in her guilt, then, well, okay, he was just following the law and having her executed. So, yes, you're absolutely right. So Cromwell, Lady Rochford, they become these sort of evil kind of scapegoats that people blame things on when, again, you know, and you know what's so interesting, Owen, and actually so heartbreaking as well, that I think actually Anne also for a period thought the same thing. Let's think back to the the sermon, that controversial sermon that her almoner gave where Cromwell is compared to, you know, the biblical traitor. Henry is not. He's the he's the gentle king. He's compared to the gentle king. And it's this this traitor that convinces the king to do these awful things to his Jewish subjects. You know, that's the 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 story of the Bible. And this is what Anne is pressing as well. So at, at this point, 
and it's it's really awful and tragic you know she might also be thinking oh it's Cromwell it's Cromwell poisoning him against me you know whereas I think she definitely realizes after very soon in fact that it's not Cromwell that it's Henry but at that point I think even she wanted to be part of that whole you know story where it is a love story how could he do this to me you know it must be somebody else's doing so it's so interesting yeah that you brought that up it's a less bitter pill isn't it to swallow and it's harder therefore to see it as this royal romance uh once you know who the real agent of Anne's downfall is and that is Henry let's talk quickly about Jane Boleyn what do you make of her relationship with Anne She's another one that has been so maligned over the centuries, poor Jane, and really has done absolutely zero, nothing to deserve it. And we have virtually no evidence to, you know, we don't have any evidence to say that she had anything to do with their downfall. So Jane Boleyn is sent away from court because she's defending Anne. So this is what, this this kind of makes me a little bit crazy because it's like she is sent away from court because she has defended Anne. There's a woman at court and this is 1534 we're talking now. Late 1534, somebody's caught Henry's eye, who knows, As we said, Anne has to keep challenging as a mistress. She cannot turn a blind eye. She just simply can't. She's not in the position to do that. She's feeling too insecure. She realizes her relationship is based on emotions, as we've said. She knows her husband is fickle. She needs to challenge. And she decides to ask uh, Lady Rochford for her help. So this is her brother's wife, her sister-in-law. And they come up with some plan to get rid of this woman because she's not showing Anne the proper respect. Unfortunately, the whole thing backfires and Henry, in fact, sends Jane Boleyn away from court. Now, Owen, I wish I could tell you more. We do not see Jane again until she pops up, possibly again at the end of 1535. But the next time we see her, she is is intervening on behalf of George after he's been arrested. So there is no evidence to suggest she, she wanted any of this to happen. In fact, I think she well understood that her fate was completely intertwined with that of the Boleyn family. She understood her finances would be in dire straits if anything happened to George. It doesn't matter which way you look at this. There is no reason why Jane would want George dead, why why she'd want Anne dead. Any evidence, if you look at the whole period, points to them being a close family. I think sometimes as well, because George and Jane did not have children that we know of, and well, that Jane didn't fall pregnant that we know of that isn't recorded. There's this idea that theirs was an awful relationship. And so if theirs was an awful relationship, oh, Jane must have been jealous of the incredible relationship that George had with Anne. So it's all this, it's all based on just conjecture and, and just no evidence. It's literally made up, you know, to blame somebody because there needs to be someone, you know, standing behind the, the curtain looking, you know, grimacing in all the shows. And it's Jane Boleyn, isn't it? We see it so many times. Yeah. It's Yes, it's a tale as old as time, isn't it? And poor Jane really has been cast as this sister-in-law from absolute hell. But I'm so glad you've come to that conclusion as well, um, because actually... And it sounds controversial to say it, and it really shouldn't, because I think it's there in the historical record. I think she's a loyal woman. I think, and I think she does what she is told. I think she does things for people that she cares about, and I think that ultimately leads her her to the block. Now, talking about blocks, something terrible is about to happen. There are some charges that are going to be levied, not only against Anne, but against her brother. What happens? What charges are levied? And how is Anne imprisoned? This is the awful bit of the story, isn't it? The bit that I was really not looking forward to get. It's so strange. I wrote this, took like three years to research and write it. And I knew what was coming. I knew what was going to happen at the end. And I just didn't, I just didn't want to get there. And I actually think this is why towards the end, I procrastinated and kind of left it and came back to it and left and came back to it because I knew that what I was going to see was not going to be in any sort of way pleasant. It's vicious. It's quite shocking and it would have been incredibly shocking at the time. That's the other thing to keep in mind. So if we just briefly cover some of the things that happened in 1536, because I think that then will make more sense. So January 1536 is a nightmarish month for Anne and and for Henry in many ways as well. So Catherine of Aragon dies at the beginning of, of January 1536. There is an initial sort of uh, jubilant response, I suppose you could say, from from Henry in particular, but also perhaps from Anne. We only really have one account that she's kind of in a celebratory mode, but um, it doesn't last long because she's an intelligent woman. And what she realizes very quickly is that Henry was blaming everything on Catherine. And now that Catherine's gone, 
all his troubles suddenly are due to Anne. So, and I think this is something that Henry began to realise already in 1535, and I do make that case that I think he realises that, oh, wait a second, is it Catherine causing me all the problems or is it because of my marriage to Anne? So he's already, that seed's been planted. So Catherine of Aragon dies. Um, Henry VIII, unfortunately, has an accident on the tilt yard. He's training, he's possibly training for the May Day joust that is coming up, 1st of May, where the king would normally be taking part in jousting. He has a very embarrassing for Owen. He's just, you know, he's he's not in any competition. There's a lot of misconception about this event as well. There is no formal event taking place. He's just at Greenwich. He's with the people that many of which end up on the scaffold. He is training and he falls off his horse. Probably saved his life that he was training because it's probable that the horse would not have been, that Henry wouldn't have been, armed. well, that the horse wouldn't have been armoured, sorry, so that when it falls on top of the king, which is supposedly what happened, he manages to escape with his life. So that event happens. And we also have another horrific, awful event. And we know Anne's pregnant up until this point. She, at some point following Henry's fall, miscarries her baby. So the traditional account is that the miscarriage occurred on the 29th of January, which was the day of the interment of Catherine of Aragon. What I propose and what I think I found is that that is not correct. It happened probably within days of Henry's fall and possibly on the day of Catherine's interment and was still in fact either miscarrying or had just miscarried. But that date is given. We only hear that date in a dispatch from Chapuis in February and I think it was done to just again emphasize the goodness of Catherine and how evil Anne is that God has punished her by losing her son on the day of Catherine's funeral as a real kind of, you know, it's just one of those morality lessons. And it's just been repeated over and over and over. Henry knew by the morning of the 29th that there was no baby. So it must have happened before that is, is what I argue. So this is a terrible, terrible blow. So Henry is suffering. His ego has been absolutely destroyed following the accident. And now Anne has lost the baby. So he comes out with these statements that are really terrifying where he says, I see that God will not give us sons. I see that God will not give us children. And you see that fantasy that he's got in his head now doesn't match the reality in any way. So we know what's going to happen. You know, people are going to die. He's going to remove people. He's going... he, Henry cannot accept mistakes. He does not make mistakes, according to Henry. It's always somebody else's fault. So he always looks around him to blame the closest person to him. In this case, it's Anne. We have a sort of period where things appear to return to normal. You know, Anne's granted different lands in March, her father's granted lands. Um, We have the sermon that we discussed that takes place at the start of April. And then a very important date, which is the 18th of April, we have Chapuis come to court. That's the only recorded time of him ever meeting Anne, interestingly. Um, So the rest is sort of hearsay that he's commented on. But they do meet that day. And it's all very courteous and and fine. There's There's no issue whatsoever. But something does happen that day that's very important, and that is that Henry gives Cromwell a very public and very humiliating dressing down, Um, so much so that Cromwell has to make an excuse that he's thirsty and he has to go get a drink of water because he's mortified. He's absolutely mortified. Basically, Henry, in very Henry style, turns on him in a moment and um, months of negotiations that he's been having with Chapuis and the emperor, you know, trying to improve relationships there, Henry basically pretends that he never knew about or that he wasn't part of or that he shouldn't have been doing, So, which Cromwell cannot believe. So he leaves court that day knowing that he, what he thought, he thought he had Henry's support and he thought that Anne couldn't touch him because Henry was completely supportive of him and he realized and he said something along the lines those who trust princes kind of need to think again he understands that there's no guarantee that henry's going to support him against anne if something was to happen and he goes to kind of lick his wounds with chapuis um but he says the game's not over yet don't worry you know he's still got things up his sleeve so that's a really important moment because we see the things turn deadly after that Cromwell is feeling vulnerable, Anne's feeling vulnerable, Henry's feeling vulnerable. It is, it's a perfect storm, unfortunately. And remember, I mentioned how Anne becomes quite irritable and maybe speaks a little bit out of turn when she's feeling very vulnerable. This is exactly what we see. She is brilliant and intelligent and sharp, but she, on the last weekend of April, makes some very serious mistakes. So, you know, when she's having conversations with some of the men at court, She says things that other people overhear, and then these are uh, used against her. 
the one in particular when she's talking to Sir Henry Norris and she says, you look for dead men's shoes. If it came to the king but good, you would look to have me. In other words, if the king died, you'd want to marry me. You know, this is this is treason. We're remembering the new treason act that even imagining the king's death is in fact treason. This is carried down the hallways and to Henry's ears. And before long, we the arrests begin. And I think Mark Smeaton was the first one. She also has an encounter with Smeaton that could be interpreted as inappropriate for the Queen. So that is also viewed by people, witnesses, and, and used against her. So the 30th, probably the 30th of, of April, I think Smeaton is arrested. Poor man, when he realised that it was Thomas Cromwell himself questioning him, I think must have just, oh my goodness, what a, what a terrifying moment. And the May Day Festival goes ahead as planned. You know, the king is there, Anne is there. That is the last time he sees his wife. And I also argue that this was very much planned, that Henry knew exactly what he was doing. This was no accident. He didn't receive a last-minute letter saying, oh, somebody's confessed. He knew this. He planned it. Henry's a performer. He wanted a really dramatic exit. He wanted it to show for the final time that, yes, he might not be jousting because of his accident. It might be George Boleyn jousting and Henry Norris jousting. However, he is the king and he's in control. So he kind of raises them all and it's really awful. He raises them one final time so that that crash that comes the next day or the same day, sorry, would be as dramatic and as awful as possible for those men. And Anne is then arrested the following day on on the second while she's at Greenwich. You know, she receives news that she's to go see the council and she's later taken to the tower where some of the other men are there already. And then there's some further arrests following that. That's absolutely fascinating. I mean, it's so shocking and quick, isn't it? I mean, it really is. It is quick. But when do you think that Henry closed his heart to Anne? Yeah, it's, a, it's such a difficult one, isn't it? I was, you know, kind of thinking about this and reflecting on it for literally years and going back and forth. Like, when was it exactly? And I have to say, I, I think, as I said, I think he's been thinking about this throughout 1535 to be rid of her one way or another. I don't think he was thinking of having her executed at that early point. I think that that was when she lost, well, as he would have seen it, she lost their baby. It was a son by all accounts. And he realised, he felt, Henry acts very violently towards people when he feels that you've injured him personally. If you If he feels that you've injured him kind of personally, you know, he's going to attack. And he feels that this is what Anne's done, that she has, in fact, lied to him. She's promised him sons. She's promised him stability. She's promised him. And what she's delivered in his eyes, of course, I'm speaking, in Henry's eyes, is none of that. You know, she's given him trouble. It's been chaos since the moment he he laid eyes on her. It's been chaos for Henry. You know, he's had to be excommunicated for this. He's had to lose her, the, the respect of so many of his subjects for his passion for Anne because she promised sons. And now what has she delivered except apart from absolute chaos? So he feels that she has betrayed him in the worst possible way. It has nothing to do with her having sex with five other men. That's ridiculous. We know that that didn't happen. There's just no, the evidence is ridiculous. It's a farce. Everyone knows it. What she did do, was not live up to his fantasy. And that was enough for Henry to to go from that passion that we see at the beginning of the relationship to literally pursuing her death with the same, that same ardency, that same fervor that he pursued her in the first place. And it's it's terrifying and it's shocking. And I think the losing, I think had she given birth to a healthy son, that would have matched Henry's fantasy. So things would have maybe improved for a while. I don't know if it would have lasted forever, but it would have improved for a while. I think that was the final straw for him. And he felt that she had betrayed him terribly, absolutely terribly. And he felt that he was, that it was justice, the end that came to Anne, which is awful, but I I really do feel that. So you're very much of my mind, and I think this comes brilliantly in the book, that he feels what he's doing is justifiable. Oh, yes even if he does not believe her to be guilty of the things that she is charged with. And you're, you very much believe that he did not, as some historians like to argue, think that Anne was guilty of adultery, of guilty of incest and, and guilty of plotting his death. Oh, is that no, correct? Abso- absolutely. I think Henry 
knew 100% that Anne was not guilty. Basically, it was impossible for her to have committed. We've talked about the fact she's never alone. And we see later with Catherine Howard that other people are implicated because you need help. If you're a queen of England, you're going to be having affairs with five different men, including your own brother. You need help. And no one else, not one of Anne's ladies are arrested during this period of time. Very importantly, they pretty much all go on to serve Jane Seymour. Now think about this, Owen. If there's a queen, she's incredibly adulterous. She's getting help from her ladies, presumably, because how is she doing all of this? Are you then going to put those same ladies in with your next wife? Like it's it's completely <laughs> ridiculous. And the reason why the ladies didn't suffer any consequences is because there was no crime. There was no crime. The only crime was that Anne didn't live up to Henry's fantasy. That is the only crime. You know, that that record he's got playing in his head. She was supposed to give him sons. She was supposed to be popular with the people. It was supposed to be this lovely relationship. And in the end, it was just, it was battles. It was sunshine. It was storms, as you know. It was tempestuous. That is why, in the end, it's only Anne and the men that suffer, and there's no other women because there was no crime to be involved in in the first place. But it is shocking to see how he turns on her. I feel like that's one of the things that shocked me the most, to see how he was really pursuing her death. That's what he wanted. That's such a such a great point. It really is. Now, I'm going to have to ask you this question. It's not one that I enjoy asking you. Was Anne guilty of anything? Did she do anything wrong? It's a difficult one, isn't it? I think she was definitely not guilty of any of the crimes that she was accused of. So she was accused of adultery, incest, and conspiring the king's death. I have to emphasize that point because that is the one that got her executed, conspiring the king's death. You know, she was said to have obviously that conversation that she had about dead men's shoes was interpreted as her imagining the king's death and then wanting to marry after he was dead. But she's also accused of having met up with some of the men while she was having trysts with them and and discussing Henry's death and, and what's going to happen after it. And the dates are all wrong. I actually include all the dates at the end and kind of go through all of them and say, well, this is impossible because she wasn't here or blah, blah, blah. So I do do that as well. So uh, adultery, no, I don't think she was guilty of adultery whatsoever. Uh, Conspiring the king's death, no, because she knew that Henry's protection was protecting her. So that's kind of ridiculous. And incest with George, absolutely not. They were extremely close. They had a very, very close loving relationship. They were both so similar, you know, so, so similar in terms of personality, behavior, interests. They loved each other like brother and sister. And that was, of course, manipulated and used because they needed shock value. It needed to shock everyone into thinking that Anne was this outrageous woman doing all these horrific things to Henry, the good king. You know, he needed to come out of this looking good, looking good. How do you come out of looking good after you've executed your wife? Well, you make your wife out to be this kind of crazy, lustful, you know, vengeful, horrific woman. And part of that reputation, unfortunately, has lasted till this day, which is really sad. But um, what was she possibly guilty of? Perhaps, you know, even Anne maybe thought it herself, maybe not being humble enough, you know, towards Henry. She, like I said, had a very sharp tongue, would often get together with George. And perhaps there's, um, I think it's, I don't think this is in the trial records, but I think it's in one of Chapuis' correspondence from memory where he says that they would laugh at the king's ballads. They'd laugh at things that he was wearing. You know what, Owen? I actually think that's true. I think they were both 100% capable of doing that. And you can see them both so brilliant, so capable, looking at Henry that perhaps isn't always as brilliantly capable and laughing at him. That's probably the only thing that I can, you know, kind of say in terms of what she did. The rest is just, is all Henry's doing, all of it. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I I think you're absolutely right. I think George and Anne were more than capable of mocking Henry. I think there were moments where Henry perhaps needed to be mocked. Um, a dangerous game, though, it was. One last question I'm really intrigued to know your answer to. There's a moment in George's trial where a piece of paper is delivered to him. And he is asked not to read it aloud. And it talks about Henry's virility um, and his ability, ability to please a woman. Do you think there's any possibility that this is rooted in truth as well? Is there a scenario where you can imagine that George, Jane and Anne were actually talking about Henry's performance in bed? And can we make sense of it? Because I think there might be a grain of truth to that as well. Oh, I totally agree with you. I think 
again I think there came to a point where of course George realized he was done for there was no there was no coming back from this and they show their medal don't they in those trials both of them and they also yeah. show why they could not be quietly sent away from court why they could not be exiled because they are formidable and they are formidable opponents you don't want these two against you because they they pair up and they are just brilliant aren't they they just are absolutely brilliant and so intelligent and the responses they give at court you know people are betting that George is going to be let off and this is even after the other men have already been condemned so it's impossible for George to be not guilty impossible for Anne to be not guilty because the men have already been condemned so yet they still give this awe-inspiring performance where even their enemies are now commenting on how courageous and how bold they are and how brave they are they are formidable, and I have to repeat it because it's you. You sort of get this sense of Henry being diminished by them, and Henry is a man that could be captivating, could be himself. You know, this this sort of wow, larger than life personality. You know, very handsome in his youth and very skilled at all the kind of princely you know things you had to be doing at the time. Yet he felt vulnerable in front of Anne and George. It's obvious, it's so clear that he felt diminished by their brilliance. And when they were together, it was double trouble, right? You know, the Berlins were were quiet. And this is why we're still talking about them today, because they weren't like everyone else. Yes, they were, you know, they had some similarities, but there was something, you know, that thing that you can't quite put your finger on. This is what Anne and George had. I think George did say that. I think it is you know, perfectly in keeping with what we know of George's personality, with the fact that by that point he knew he had no future. He was he was dead. He was a dead man walking. But he completely knew that. And because of how close George and Anne were, and I think also with Lady Rochford, his wife, I think it's very possible that in one of those moments where she's feeling vulnerable, where she's hurt by something possibly, you know, his, the king's attention's on Jane Seymour that we didn't touch on. But, you know, of course, that all comes out around February 1536. Anne's well aware he's paying her attention. She doesn't like it. You could clearly see Anne in a conversation with her brother and Jane saying, oh, you know what? He, he can't even do it anyway. So what's the point? Poor Jane, probably. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Just a conversation like that I can really see happening. Yeah, I can as well. I think, you know, it is one of those moments that lets us get a tiny window into those private moments that we wouldn't know about otherwise you know those secret Berlin moments and I think there's every possibility it was rooted in truth I also think there's this possibility that it might speak to Anne's anxieties about her her um, situation I mean she you know if you, if you look at contemporary ideas about how procreation works yeah. There was an emphasis on a woman having to have pleasure in the sexual act. It was believed by many to be a vital component of releasing the female seed. You know, there had to be pleasure. And if, if you know, we think for a moment that Anne is, you know, concerned about her ability to conceive, and my goodness, why wouldn't she uh, at this point? You know, I, I think we might actually have a window into a very human moment here that is spun, like all of the other charges, are rooted in these moments that do have truth in them. These, these you know, comments that Anne makes and and then spun into something completely ludicrous. I think they, I think there are strands here that are rooted in reality, and perhaps those are the best light, the ones that do contain a, a grain of truth. Maybe that was. Cromwell's genius and he's yeah maybe that was how how he how he operated I think you're completely Um, correct I think he I think he was a genius and I think you're right he played on all of Anne's vulnerabilities she was vulnerable to these charges you know people could believe this of her if you laid these charges against Catherine of Aragon people would laugh they would say what are you talking about because she's spent her her lifetime being this perfect queen doing the job so brilliantly Anne was not raised to be a queen So she has, and perhaps Catherine did in private times as well, but I think she would have been much more guarded. Anne was completely unguarded towards the end because she was under this incredible strain. We still get flashes of her brilliance, which is what I love though, and we get it in the trial. We get it during her imprisonment. You know, we get it after the the tragic loss of her baby where she's the one consoling her ladies rather than the other way around. They are bereft for her because they know what this means. 
people know, you know, they couldn't have envisioned that she'd be executed, but I think that she'd be supplanted was just everyone knew that's what was going to happen, you know. But then we get these flashes of the brilliant Anne, which is what I love. You know, we see her consoling her ladies. We see her standing up to Thomas Cromwell. Like, imagine, you know, the courage that that would take. Try and put yourself in her position. She's vulnerable, yet she's she's going on the attack. She's It's her preemptive strike. You know, she is courageous and brilliant, and she's defending her family. Um, and we see when she's arrested, there are moments where she is, yes, of course, shocked by the charges and and not behaving in a very, I uh, suppose, queenly fashion. But then she quickly regains focus. And then, you know, at, at the end, she is, wow, it is just, it's moving to see how brilliant she is. She does everything that she's supposed to do. And she meets her end in an incredibly bold and dignified way, which people are commenting on in Europe almost immediately. You know, this is why Henry wants a private private execution because he doesn't he knows Anne he knows she's going to to meet her end with elegance and dignity and he doesn't want people spreading those rumors unfortunately unfortunately for Henry unfortunately for us lots of people actually do get in to see the the execution and do send favorable reports of her end to Europe and across the country so and in the trial you know we see how brilliant she is we see how brilliant George is and you see how insecure Henry is really deeply insecure and that leads him to do a lot of the things that he does in his reign deeply insecure but always in control Owen Uh, I could not agree more Natalie I think this is one of the most important books on Anne Boleyn to have been published in my lifetime uh, if not ever it really is a masterclass I think in how we all need to revisit and reinterrogate and to reconceptualize who this woman was and why she matters. And I think you do that brilliantly. And I I really cannot commend this book more highly to anyone listening to this. It's such an important book. It builds on so many amazing historians' works, but it goes beyond them too. And the amount of myths that you have busted in this book is quite astonishing and I think it's a genius work so my huge congratulations oh thank you so much that's that made me teary that's amazing you know after all these years of work it's it's so I I just can't think of who I'd rather speak to about it so I'm so happy to have spoken to you and I'm just so happy that you enjoyed it and that you saw value in it you know that's that's very important to me because obviously you're a Berlin expert. So it's always nerve wracking to give something about the Berlins to a Berlin expert, but um, it's been an incredible journey. I don't know if I, when I'll have the energy to do it over again. Oh, and people have been writing saying, Oh, you should do the final year of Catherine of Aragon. You know, you should do the final year, which would be interesting from that perspective. But it, it, it was an emotional roller coaster for me. It was incredibly draining as you can imagine but so fulfilling and so, and I feel like I've gained a lot of insights from it. So um, thank you for speaking to me about it. And thank you to everyone who's ordered it and who's been sending me lovely messages. It just absolutely makes my day when I wake up to, you know, a, a picture or a comment from someone. And the book is actually out there. I, I received a picture today, Owen, the physical book. So your copy should be almost with you. So, so excited. I mean, I've read it quite a few times now, Natalie, but there is nothing quite like having the physical copy in your hand. So I, oh my God, I cannot wait. I really can't. And I have to say on a completely superficial note, it's one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen. It's one of the most beautiful books. The cover's lovely, isn't it? Oh, my God, it's yeah. really, really beautiful. <laughs> um, so huge congratulations on that front. But I, I can, you know, truly say that the beauty of it is matched inside. It's an astonishing feat. And I hope you, you get all the, des- you know, the praise and wonderful feedback that you deserve um, because it's quite an accomplishment. My hearty congratulations to you. Thank you. Always lovely speaking to you, my friend. I can't wait for our next conversation. 
Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. <laughs> <laughs>